So um, I wanted to talk to a little bit today about Jesus. Is that okay? Is that a good topic? And you know, I, you know, you may need healing in your elbow or whatever. And can we just wait a little bit? Because I would like to just exalt Jesus a little bit today. Amen. And I think that in the midst of that, as we talk about Jesus, you might get something. Amen. But we have to know, I was talking about the Lord's Prayer the other Wednesday night. It says, when we're praying, we say, Our Father who art in heaven. And we, the first thing we need to do when we're praying, if we're praying, we need to exalt God and realize who it is that we're talking to. And I want to I talk a little bit about Jesus, his nature and character. And one thing that I think we don't realize and we forget, we've humanized, we, I love the humanity of Jesus. I love how personal he is. I love that he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I love his nearness. I love that I can identify with him as a person. You know, he was embodied when he came to earth. But you know, he wasn't always like that. And I want to talk a little bit about his nature and character. It says in Revelations 1.8, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who was and is and who is to come, the Almighty. He's Almighty God. Jesus is Almighty God. And when he was, now before Jesus, you guys seem so far away. I'm going to have to move my operation here. <laughs> Don't worry, I love you, that part of the church too. Praise the Lord. It's a little better. He was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That was before Jesus was ever embodied. Amen? Now, it says in Genesis 1, um, Oh, I hope I didn't give you the wrong scriptures, Norm. What do you got there? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now that says God created the heavens and the earth. And I just quoted you the scripture that in the beginning was the word. And the word, that was God there. That was Jesus Christ. He was not always in bodily form. He was a spirit. I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between his nature and his character. His character has remained the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always been good. He's always been loving. Don't tell me about an Old Testament God that wasn't loving. I mean, you look up tender mercies or loving kindness in the Old Testament. There's thousands of references. Now, I'm not saying under the law that if you didn't behave, it would go very well with you, but it still behooves us to obey the word of God. Amen. I heard recently that the law is the guidelines for our life that it will go well with us. What does it say? Honor thy father and mother. That's the first commandment with promise. That what? That it might go well with you. You stay within the guidelines of the word of God and it'll go well with you. Amen. So Jesus wasn't always the figure that, that we've seen painted with the you know, nice beard. They said I used to look like Jesus when I was a hippie when I first got saved. You probably remember me like that. <laughs> Mike and Jan were so instrumental in when I first got saved because you know, if there was anything said of Mike, that it, it'll probably be on his tombstone. This guy loved God. I've, I never saw anybody that passionate. And that's where we learned to street witness. And, and he introduced me to street preaching. We'd go to bus stops where we had a captive audience. And Mike would go, I want to introduce you to Mark Reed. <laughs> Jesus loves you. He was so radical. But it was so fun. We, and we saw people get saved and we saw amazing things. And I think he was the inspiration for our bar ministry when we first had that. There's a guy we just ran into. His name is Leon Dean. He, we got, got him saved out of a bar. He's an evangelist to this day. Hallelujah. And that's Jesus. Jesus saved me. Jesus saved him. Jesus is our King and Lord. But, so Jesus, in his nature, has not always been the same. His nature was spirit before he was incarnated. If you read in the first chapter of Ezekiel, 
the revelation that Ezekiel had of God, when, when God's, it's like God's throne came up. He said, I saw all this whirlwind and dust coming, and he had a revelation of God's throne. It said, you talk about rims. It says the rims on the wheels of his throne were awesome, that he couldn't even describe it. And things about God, you'll see in the writers, that, that there are no words to describe the things that are in the spirit realm. We're created beings, but in the uncreated realm, in the realm of God, there's no words to describe it. So writers like Ezekiel, he'll say it had the appearance of this. It appeared like Jasper, but it was, it was far greater than Jasper. It, he had the appearance of a man, but it was something very different. He even says, uh, or they'll say the likeness of something, or he'll, say, he'll even say it was the appearance of a, the likeness of something. You can't even describe it. I've heard of, how many have heard people that have gone to heaven, okay? How many have a little skepticism about some of those testimonies? You know, not, none of you holy people. But anyway, <laughs> but I've heard some that I, uh, that I respect. And this one lady was saying that when she was in the presence of God like that, she said, and it's, it's out of our realm of thinking, she said there were colors that you could feel. Wow, you ever heard of anything like that on earth? They were so vivid, I suppose when she saw a ray of purple, it felt one way, and a ray of gold, it felt another way, and the rays coming up off the streets felt another way. Wow. It's another realm. We're on earth. I'm gonna get out of here one day though. You ever had those days with like rapture? Please, right? Take me away, Calgon. So, uh, so he said, I am the Alpha, Revelation 1, I'm the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, says the Lord, who was and is and is to come. Somebody wrote this. I, I can't remember the quote. It says, let us know you as you are, that we may adore you as we should. Isn't that good? Let us know you as you are, that... Who wants a God of their imagination? Who wants a God that's just a little more powerful than you? Jesus is almighty God. He is almighty God. And, and, and at this time, when he created everything, uh, he, he was in spirit. He was the same that you, the you, uh, way that you talk about God uh, when you just think of God the Father or God in the heavenly realm, this is where Jesus was. Uh, it says, uh, he, well, in Philippians 2.5, it says he was in the form of God. I'm going to keep going here. I don't have a lot of time. Uh, John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing made Nothing was made that was made. And in Colossians 1, 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him, and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Wow. He is before all things, and everything exists for him. That includes what? Us. Jesus is not for us, we're for him. We're for his pleasure. It says, for his pleasure we were created. Jesus was there when everything that we know was spoken into existence. A lot of time when I was raised, I thought, you know, first time he showed up was in the manger, right? And I was, I was raised in a certain denomination where I thought in heaven it was like, I thought the Trinity was like Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus. I'm sorry. I was confused. Jesus didn't appear the first time 2,000 years ago. He was there when everything created 
that we know was there. Now, I don't know if you're an evolutionist or what. God loves evolutionists. He even loves atheists. But let this stretch you a little bit. It says first he created the earth, and then it says he created the sun and the moon and the stars to declare his glory. That doesn't really fit that we were a little ball of fire that spun off of the sun and took a couple million years to cool, and then some amoeba came from outer space, and here we are. He created the earth first, and then the sun and the moon and the stars are just to declare his glory. Wow. Who created all that? God the Father? Nope. Left it to Jesus. That's the God we serve. Wow. It's too awesome. We've got too awesome of a God. We've got to know how awesome he is. We've got to live like he's awesome, folks. Your life has to be more than, yeah, I go to church. He spoke all things into existence. And it says the earth was without form and void. How come when we hear that we think it was a ball? It was without form. The original there is it just all the elements were there. You probably spoke to them earlier. Need some carbon, need some dioxide. I don't know how he did it. But everything was without form and void, and then he's like, boom. Turned it into a ball. That's Jesus. He was in spirit form at that time. Think about this. Oh. God has stopped the clock just like he did for Joshua. <laughs> Think about this. Think about this now. God has never learned anything. That will make your little mind smoke. <laughs> God has never learned anything. He's all knowledge. Nothing can take... As, so as soon as he would have to learn something, that teacher would be God. That teacher would be God. He has always been... He has always been. Wow. He has no needs. In the world of creation, it's all about needs. If we don't have air, if we don't have water, we're, we're inter and codependent. God has absolutely no needs. And Jesus, from eternity past, had absolutely no needs. The word necessary is foreign to God. It's like necessary? I am absolutely complete in myself. If I want another universe, I'll just speak it. If I'm done with the universe, I can speak that too, so you better watch yourself. That's right. He's holy. He's mighty. He needs no defense. He doesn't need any comp company. He doesn't need any company. When I see what, like, when it says that God said, let us make man in our Im image, I think of the fellowship that they had among themselves, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Perfect fellowship for eternity. And now they got us. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Don't think you're that necessary. What if they said, what if they just got to swooning and said, Father, we should just go back to the old days. <laughs> why, you know, why can't we just get along? You know, why can't everybody just get along like we did for eons and eons and eons? He has no need. He's absolutely fulfilled in himself. He doesn't need any help. Don't we kind of portray the Christian service like that? Help God out. You know, help him go reach the pagans, you know. He, he, 
He got himself in trouble because he loved too much, and now he needs your help. No, it ain't like that, is it, Scott? You do it for his sake. He's completely complete. I, can you find that? Did you find that poem, or were you ever put that up there? I ran across this. Did you find it or get it? The old hymn writers understood some of this stuff. This guy is an amazing hymn writer. We don't have songs like this anymore. This one, I think, is called Meditations on the Godhead. People used to just meditate on the Trinity and just how awesome God is. Thine own self forever filling with self-kindled flame. In thyself thou art distilling unctions without name. He's just brewing up anointings and goodness that he'll probably never even get a chance to use. Just the same way that if you leave something out and it'll rot naturally, when you have a being like God who is infinite and he is only good and he is only love, his nature is love, what's the natural result? Just more and more good. It's just like, what am I going to do with all this stuff? <laughs> he's got all these concoctions. He's got anointings, concoctions, blessing. That he doesn't even know what to do with. <laughs> My clock moved again. Okay. <laughs> so it says, uh, Without worshiping of creatures, without veiling of thy features, God, always the same. He's still like that, folks. He's still like that. He is worthy. He is absolutely worthy of our service. Wow. Here's a little of the nature of God. Exodus 19, 18, 20 and 21. Now Mount Sinai, now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. How many you know he was a brave man? <laughs> Everybody else goes, you go, Moses. You're our man. You're our priest. You are our priest. You go. We're going to be back here interceding. So Moses went up and the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord and many of them perish. The raw, awesome presence of God is so intense that at that time you could look on him and perish. Boom. Wow. Exodus 33, 20. But he said to he said, you, Moses, cannot see my face, so no man shall see me and live. This is the nature that Jesus Christ was in before he was incarnate. It is the absolute greatest humbling of all times. I've heard very weak illustrations that God came to earth. It's kind of like watching ants, you know. He came down to be an ant like us. To talk. You know why he had to take on the veil of flesh? To protect us from himself. And so now he goes from a nature that has never learned anything Absolute all knowledge that has never needed anything to a baby that knows absolutely nothing and is absolutely dependent upon everything. Wow. Why would he do that? Because he so loved the world that he wanted to give his son the father wanted to give his son so that we could just believe and live. That's pretty awesome. Now it says, as he went along, he learned. He had to begin to learn. For the first time, 
in eternity, he had to begin to learn. Wouldn't that be humbling? But it's, maybe it's a weird thought. But don't you think as he went through life and he began to learn and started coming into, that he had some of the biggest cases of deja vu <laughs> that you'd ever had? It's like, I feel like I made this mountain. You know? It's like, what? Wouldn't that be weird? But he lived out his life and he fulfilled his purpose. He was obedient unto death, it says. And then he ascended bodily up into the clouds. Okay? And now we know he ascended bodily from this quite a few scriptures. I'm not going to get in, into them now. Uh, I love Philippians 2. You probably know it. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death of the cross. Wow. So he ascended bodily into heaven. I can You see the scenes in the Bible that you wish you would have been there? You know, just, you know, just, I don't know how it looked exactly, but it would have been really cool. But now he's glorified. He even told, he told Mary, he said, well, don't touch me now because I'm not glorified yet. And I don't know what, does anybody completely understand that? I don't get that. So I don't know if he didn't want fingerprints on him or whatever before he appeared before the Father. But, but he ascended. And the next time we see Jesus is when John the Revelator sees him. And he says this in Revelation 1, 13 and 17. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, because you can't explain anything that you're seeing, but it's like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool. This is the modern-day Jesus. This is the infinite God that's ruling and reigning right now. He's not like Michelangelo's Jesus with perfect black hair and, you know, Greek God-looking guy. His white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass as refined in a fur furnace, his voice as the sound of many waters. And in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Doesn't that kind of remind you of no, nobody can look on him and live? Wow. And what happened? And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That's the God that's up there preparing a place for us right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mark 14 says, uh, the high priest asked him, he said, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power, coming with the clouds of heaven. In Matthew 24, then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of this time, no ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh, flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if any man shall say to you, See, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall be arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, so that if it were possible, they should deceive even the very elect. This is so Import, this is such important instruction, and we got to teach our kids this because there's coming so many false Christ. And if somebody would say, we just thought he was a great preacher, but this guy is Jesus. Do you know that a lot of great preachers have spun out and began to believe they were Jesus? That happened to William Branham. 
But they say if he's over there, if he's on TV, if he's, you know, he's preaching in Minneapolis, don't believe it. Because there's only one way Jesus is coming back, and it's the same way he left through the clouds here. And it says, uh, he says, Behold, I've told you before, if they say to you he's in the desert, go not forth. If he's in secret chambers, don't believe it. If as the lightning comes out of the east and shines to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It's, he's going to come like a storm. He's going to come like the weather. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hallelujah. That's the state that he's going to return in. It's going to be awesome. How are all the tribes of the earth going to mourn? Okay. If he just pops right into Jerusalem, how are we going to all know that? I believe, and I can't verify this, but for all the tribes of the earth to mourn, I believe they all have to see him. And I believe that there's going to be an amazing procession as the Lord returns in glory. And it says that he's going to come from the east, in the, from the east to the west. And he's just going to come, and I believe he's going to be with ten thousands of his saints. He's going to be glorified, and everybody that loves him will either, you know, be caught up, and everything. That's when I believe that people will say, "I want rocks to cover me from the glory of this man." Hallelujah! And he's going to come, and I believe he's going to circle the earth, and every eye will see it, and everybody that rejected him will mourn. He'll come into Jerusalem. He'll set up his throne, and we'll reign with and rule with him for a thousand years. Hallelujah. 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 Behold, Revelation 1-7, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because him, of him. Even so, amen. And I saw heaven open in uh, Revelation 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture, vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were with, were in heaven followed him on white horses, clothed in linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that he should smite the nations, and he'll rule them with a rod of iron. He treads them with the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah.